Well, if Dr. King were to be alive and to see the kinds of circumstances that have evolved, he would be aghast. He would be critical uh, and he would remind America that we have a responsibility to all of uh, God's children. Uh, he'd be especially um, concerned about the lack of employment. In the early 60s, people were concerned because there were only 25 percent of young African-American teenagers unemployed. Now there are only 25 percent employed before they reach 20. So these kinds of things, uh, you know, feed into the distress of modern America. The circumstances that Dr. King was focused on in the last literally days of his life included the, uh, the circumstances of black men struggling for dignity on the job in Memphis, Tennessee. The garbage men, those at the very bottom who do the essential work for Americans. Uh, so Dr. King would be focused on those at the bottom in this day and age. He begins he'd be concerned with individuals who were working in the fields. He'd remind people that the contracts for improved conditions in the fields needed to be monitored. Sometimes they're just dismissed as being nice in, uh, and idealistic, but not practical. He'd be concerned about jobs sent overseas so that people overseas are doing uh, the kind of dirty work that used to be done in Detroit, but now is being done in locations where people are only paid 60 cents an hour. Uh, all those things uh, would be uh, certainly something that Dr. King would be preoccupied with in, um, if this were um, the 79th or 80th year of his life. In many respects, uh, what began to evolve in the 1980s, 1990s, and continues in this generation, African Americans more likely to be in jails and in prisons especially, uh, indicates that what could have been a dream has indeed become a nightmarish uh, kind of existence for far too many youth in inner cities today. If you go back to the state, Michigan, where he was just weeks before he was in Washington, D.C., uh, the prisons in Michigan are just catacombed with uh, young men and young women, increasingly, who have no real chance at, uh, at life after they are evicted from prison and quickly uh, find themselves in circumstances that get them sent back. So today's circumstances, whether it's, uh, you know, from the bottom of society, the jails and the prisons, or to the top, where African Americans are sometimes unfairly criticized simply because of their attempt to, uh, to pursue their administrative responsibilities in the State Department. Dr. Dr. King would be a, a severe critic of, um, of these kinds of uh, nightmarish uh, conditions in, in this day and age. And having worked five years at Soledad Prison, I can attest to the, uh, to the need that we should never forget those kinds of individuals. Ninety percent of them will be back with us walking these streets. And if we simply do nothing to help them improve, while they're in jail and prison, we're all gonna pay the price. And Dr. King went to jail many times in many different states, and he was always uh, aware of those kinds of realities, as we should be. A recommitment to the kind of uh, federal and state support that, uh, that the U.S. engaged in in World War II that we were calling the Marshall Plan. If we had a commitment to the kind of federal planning and federal support for retraining and for providing public sector jobs to, uh, to those who want to work, then we could begin to turn this society around. Uh, there is nothing at all that is wrong with the kind of uh, commitment to a modern day Marshall Plan that would bring about real significant change. If 
America could help Europe come back from the uh, catastrophe of World War II, and we failed to try and help Chicago and St. Louis and Pittsburgh come back from the loss of jobs in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, then we're not going to get on a track that's going to take us anywhere other than remaining in a nightmarish circumstance where prison is often more of a reality than the payroll. And we need the payroll, not the prison. Well, black on black violence is often connected with low self-esteem. But most of the prisoners are involved uh, for small drug offenses. And I think the sentencing changes are going to really begin to bring about the possibility of some change in that as we begin to see um, sentencing models that, uh, that don't treat uh, small drug possession uh, as it was in the 80s and 90s. But that means that we're going to have other challenges as people come out of um, incarceration. If they don't have training opportunities, and if they don't have the opportunity for public sector supported jobs, then we're going to just have the same kind of issues that have plagued um, us for the last 30 years. Uh, and I'm concerned about that. And we need to have more focus on retraining those who really want to turn their lives around when they get out of those uh, decrepit circumstances. And increasingly, it's women. This is not just the home of the brave and the land of the free, but it's also the home of the female prisoner. We have more than a million people in jails and prisons, and we should always be aware of that. If, if Dr. King were around today, there's no doubt that Dr. King would be in the forefront of those who were supporting the rights and extending rights to people who happen to be gay. Uh, in Dr. King's inner circle, he didn't discriminate against people who happen to be gay. Um, if he were around today, he'd be in the forefront of those supporting the, uh, the chance for people who happen to be uh, Latinos to get real papers under circumstances that allow them to have their dignity and don't treat them as if they are wayward children. If he were alive today, I'm sure he would have transformed his approach to the women's movement. He was already on the way to doing that when he was struck down so tragically. Uh, so it, it's easy to project that Dr. King would be on the right side of virtually every movement because he was on the right side of every movement that was around when he was with us. So we have to take that logic and we have to take the logic of Dr. King's activism because he gave his energy as well as his time. And when youngsters devote their energy, then they can begin to have an impact in a very positive way. One thing that will really give you some clues about where the activism begins to uh, meander into a, a passive uh, defense is looking at what happens to the Oakland, California-based Black Panther Party. When the Black Panther Party begins to, uh, to really embrace the, uh, the rhetoric of revolution, and the FBI and all the other espionage agents uh, really begin to, um, to undermine uh, and infiltrate and devastate the Panther Party, um, then you're beginning to see people get so intimidated by the deaths um, that they begin to move away from trying to be in the street activists. Um, and then you also have to understand that the activism dies away because people won the struggle. They won the right to vote. And that was cataclysmic. That was wonderful. 
people embraced that, we understood, you know, that now you have to get into politics. Okay? So victories and intimidation. And people grow up. You know, it's a generational thing. It was the baby boom generation coming of age in their teens and 20s that, you know, they're the cadres of the movement. As they get into their 30s, you know, they're beginning to have children. And as they begin to have children, you know, things begin to get transformed very quickly. And the war in Vietnam was brought to a conclusion, uh, and a lot of people were not exactly thrilled by it, but, you know, people move on to other things. The woman's movement, so needed, begins to, you know, dissipate energy away from the southern movement. And then there's a whole uh, reconfiguration of the American economy. Detroit lost a half million jobs. New York City loses hundreds of thousands of jobs. So people are, you know, they're transfixed on trying to find a way to make a living in an evolving economy. So all those things, uh, you know. And then you have uh, all the impact of the drug culture. And like I said, 63 was like the last you know, weeks of American innocence. By the late 60s, the drug culture, if people tell you that, you know, that San Francisco in 1967 and 68 was a summer of love, I have to remind you, it was also the summer of speed and all the other drugs that were beginning to emerge. And they also just had a devastating impact on a lot of activists.